Okay, hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Maine Health Management Coalition's webinar today. My name is Marie Stuckey. I am the Member Relations Specialist here. And I just want to start off by thanking our presenters today for their time and participation, and I will introduce them in just a moment. But first, we'd just like to uh, give you a brief explanation of uh, how we run our webinars. I'm going to start with a little bit of an overview about the coalition for anybody on the phone who is a, uh, a non-member, and then let you know about some upcoming events. Um, you should also know that our presentation today will be available on our website should you want to access it later. And uh, there will be a webinar survey sent to you afterwards, and uh, we would love to hear back from you so that we can uh, best serve you for future webinars, and feel free to suggest any topics of interest. At any time during the webinar, feel free to type questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll save those for the end of the uh, presentation and ask our presenters to address them at that time. Uh, so a little bit about the Maine Health Management Coalition. Um, it is a purchaser-led partnership among multiple stakeholders working collaboratively to improve health and to maximize the value of health care services for the employees and dependents of Maine Health Management members and all the residents of Maine. Our vision is to have uh, the state of Maine lead the country in population health status, patient care experience, and low per capita health care expenditures. Uh, for a favorable business climate and economic growth and job development. Our multi-stakeholders are comprised of consumers, purchasers, health plans, brokers, benefit consultants, providers, and affiliates, and we currently have over 70 members. We achieve our mission um, through a variety of ways, but uh, our data department is the foundation of everything that we do. Um, we have an all-payer statewide claims database to help you understand your health care spend. And um, we also achieve our mission through transparency and public reporting on our consumer website, Get Better Maine, where providers publicly report on their outcome, safety, and patient experience and cost ratings. Um, so I encourage you to direct your employees to check out Get, Get Better Maine so that they can find um, the best quality providers to help them improve health and productivity. We also um, achieve our mission through consumer engagement with programs such as CEO Champions and uh, a wellness trust that we're developing in our value-based insurance design model, uh, which you will see under the benefit design uh, portion. That's where we are uh, working with patient and providers to develop uh, a plan that is coordinated for appropriate, high-quality, patient-centered care uh, for the best cost and quality. And you can uh, access a webinar uh, that we previously had, had on value-based insurance design on our website if you'd like to, and you can contact me for information on that. But the, the uh, the basis of the plan is that it rewards payers, patients, and providers for outcomes using evidence-based care instead of fee-for-service models. And I encourage you to uh, find out about joining a VIVID work group, too, so you can actually influence the development of this plan, which is set to launch in early 2016. Finally, we also um, work on payment reform here, exploring alternative payment arrangements with providers, hospitals, and systems that align with our goals. Um, please mark your calendars for the 17th and 24th of June. We have two webinars scheduled. Um, the first one is a shared decision-making webinar uh, covering uh, shared decision-making in primary care. And then the... where we'll have um, lots of people join together for an educational and networking event um, down in Portland, and we hope you can join us there. Other opportunities to learn and get involved would be some of our work groups, um, 
reading our newsletters, some value-based insurance design training, and we also offer some um, evidence-based medical policy training for policymakers. Here's a slide just showing um, our members, but you can also access this um, on our website under Join Today. And if you have some uh, questions about membership, feel free to contact me at any time. My phone number and email are on the bottom of the screen. And that's just a slide of some of our, uh, our members. So I'm going to begin now by presenting um, uh, our presenters for today. Uh, Chuck Hayes is um, kind enough to join us today, and he is the CEO of Maine General Health and President and CEO of Maine General Medical Center. He joined the state's third largest healthcare system in 1995 as Director of Engineering. Chuck graduated from the Massachusetts Maritime Academy in 1986 and began his career with General Dynamics in Groton, Connecticut, where he was supervisor of nuclear testing for the 688 class fast attack submarine. He then moved to Framingham, Mass where he worked at a firm which provides operational and regulatory consulting for major utilities throughout the U.S. In the, um, in the 18 years since Mid-Maine Health System joined Kennebec Valley Health System to become Maine General Health, Chuck has held a number of positions of increasing responsibility. As Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, Chuck headed the team responsible for the construction and operation of the Harold Alphonse Center for Cancer Care, which opened in July 2007. In October 2007, he was named President and CEO of Maine General Medical Center, and in January 2012, he became CEO of the parent company, Maine General Health. In addition to receiving his bachelor's degree in engineering, Chuck has earned a master's degree in business, which he began at Bentley College while living in Massachusetts and completed at Thomas College in Waterville. Chuck is and has been a member of many organizations and has served on numerous boards. So we thank you, Chuck. And now I'm going to introduce our second presenter, Denise dumont Bernier. She is the Director, Workplace Health and Maine General Medical Center, responsible for the operations of multiple freestanding occupational medicine practices in Kennebec County and numerous on-site occupational health and wellness contracted services. She was also responsible for developing Maine General's Express Care Services. She holds a baccalaureate degree in physical therapy from Simmons College, Boston. She has over 25 years of experience with providing on-site occupational health and rehabilitation services and with integrating worksite wellness services for many employers throughout Maine. Denise joined Maine General almost nine years ago has been a member of the Maine Employers Mutual Insurance Company Medical Advisory Board for over 15 years and is the chairperson for the Healthy People of Kennebec Valley, a business-driven worksite wellness council. She's presented at numerous regional and national conferences on a variety of topics. Denise has always been passionate about injury prevention and the health and safety of Maine workers. Throughout her current employment with Jane, Maine General, She's able to offer businesses an integrated solution to healthcare in the region. She believes that employers have a critical role and the power to influence healthcare consumerism through their employees and their families. In partnership, a healthier community can be built, and healthy and productive employees mean healthier main businesses. So I now introduce you to Denise Dumont Bernier and Chuck Hayes. Thank you for that introduction. I just um, start by just giving a little bit of a background of Maine General Health. Um, we're the largest employer in the greater Kennebec Valley region. We employ about 4,000 people. We have um, services, both home health and hospice, long-term care, retirement community, hospital, and physician practices. Um, we're our workplace health, which Denise runs, a division of the medical center, leads a team of over 40 people who partner with main businesses to provide employee health examinations and screenings, workers' comp, injury management, uh, health and productivity enhancement services, and we've been doing this since 1988. And we do it from really two freestanding uh, facilities in Waterville and Augusta, but also do a lot at the work site. So I did want to start by thanking the main health Management Coalition for asking us to share our experience today. Um, 
we have been part of many webinars and have done plenty of presentations, but this is really the first time <clears throat> that we've been a presenter on a webinar. So you never know, I might be tweeting next week, I'm feeling uh, technologically savvy. But we hope that you'll, um, what you'll take away today is really ideas to enhance your own wellness as well as your bottom line. So at main general, Let's see, we're just trying to move the slides here. Chuck, just try clicking on your presentation. There we go. That worked. Thank you. <clears throat> so, I mean, in general, um, our mission is to enhance every day the health of the people in the Greater Kennebec Valley. And certainly in healthcare, we have an, an organization full of people who want to help others, but often fail to take care of themselves. And although we focus on health, of, you know, the health of our community, our healthcare workers are not always making good personal health choices. In fact, when it comes to healthcare spending, um, healthcare workers spend more than most or above the national average. And that's obviously due to a multitude of factors, but it in includes access to services and really the expectation on utilization um, once they seek out healthcare services. So back in 2005, we realized we need to curb um, our increasing cost of our health plan spending. <clears throat> we have a, a self-funded plan, so it was really negatively impacting our bottom line, and we began implementing what I would call basic wellness efforts. So we'll talk more about the evolution of all these efforts uh, as the presentation goes on. But it's really been a journey and we've learned a lot of lessons. We've celebrated a lot of successes. We've also made a lot of adjustments along the way to really um, help keep pace with the changes both in our organization but also in wellness and really to breathe new life into the program um, to continue to make progress. So today, during our brief time, uh, we'd like to touch on these objectives that you see on the screen. We want to review um, why current health care trends, things like rising obesity rates, chronic disease, sedentary lifestyle, are really not sustainable and, quite frankly, costing all of us a lot of um, money and, and the impact to our bottom line. We know that we have an aging workforce and we need to pay attention to the health needs and the productivity impacts of that aging workforce. We hope that you'll learn why employee health should be applied to your overall business strategy. It's really an investment um, that pays significant dividends in the end and, and we'll talk about that a little later. And then certainly learn um, from our successes um, and we want to share what's worked for us um, and then recommend really the key elements of those success. So most of us are, experience, um, are experiencing significant insurance premium increases uh, often in the double digits and many employers are dealing with those ballooning expenses by shifting the cost burden to employees by really increasing deductibles, co-pays, co-insurances. With the Affordable Care Act, we know, now know that insurance plans are required to cover preventative care services, such as uh, mammography and colonoscopies. But the rising cost is really around um, the sick care. We have a culture that is largely sedentary and inactive. And we all know we have busy lives. Um, we often take on too much, overscheduled. Um, we're, we're not focused on our own health care in the process. And that relates even back to our families. We know that over 51% of our kids in kindergarten are considered either overweight or obese. Many of us don't take the time to plan healthy meals. You know, we zip through the fast food drive-throughs 
in between meetings or events. Um, we're eating too much processed food, and it's really impacting our health. All of this, in addition to the sedentary lifestyle, is really contributing to higher diabetes rates and other chronic conditions such as heart disease. And how many of us are actually getting eight hours of sleep per night? We know a good night's sleep is essential to good health, recuperation, and rejuvenation. So all of these trends are contributing to our poor health and rising health care costs we're all facing. But if we take a different example, and you look back to the late 80s and early 90s here in Maine, some of you may recall how the governor appointed a Blue Ribbon Commission really to address the workers' compensation crisis we were having in Maine. Our injury rate and costs were really going through the roof, and workers' comp insurance companies were refusing to underwrite uh, insurance in Maine. So Maine responded by changing our laws, but more importantly, um, employers responded by fo focusing on um, workplace safety, ergonomic programs, that prevented and really reduced injuries. And they also focused on the return to work programs, which kept injured workers in the workplace, really accommodating um, their injuries and preventing that disability mindset, really engaging the employees at work. All of this work significantly reduced the cost associated with the indemnity payments being made to workers and, and uh, that were out of work and the lost productivity um, within the business. So as you can see in this graph, we've been able to change the trend of occupational injuries and illness over the past decade substantially, you know, really in every sector. So we've done this before. Today we're facing uh, the same type of challenge around healthcare spending. People really need to take more responsibility for their personal health and lifestyle choices, but it's it's not easy. You know, we all know how hard it is to quit smoking or lose weight. There are many, many resources out in the community, but in the community, but sometimes accessing those are, are difficult. People don't know what's available to them. And then we all know behavior change is hard. Making personal lifestyle changes to be healthy is, is not easy. It's hard work. And we've learned at Maine General that really providing a personalized approach, which really meets the individual where they are, has been the foundation for our success. But employees have the opportunity to support healthy behaviors, really change the workplace through, you know, both the workplace but also their health plans. We spend a lot of time at work with coworkers in an environment that really can be conducive good health or destructive to it. Uh, when you think about lunch rooms, vending machines, you know, we used to have pizza parties that celebrated everything or cookies, back-to-back um, -back meetings, really no opportunity you know, to move or, or um, really providing, quite frankly, food that was unhealthy to our staff. You know, and, and is this really an environment that supports somebody with, say, diabetes who is trying to lose weight. The other issue that I think we're all facing too is that we have an aging workforce, um, especially here in Maine. Um, we know people have not prepared for their retirement financially um, as well as they could have or should have, and so that's forcing people to keep working um, later into their lives. Um, People want to keep working because of, you know, just stimulation. Um, I have a medical director in my practice who has been talking about retirement for the last, I swear, four to five, six years or so, and he's still working. And part of that is because he loves his work. He loves the people that he works with. He loves the work that he does. And he feels challenged and stimulated every day. And so the thought of retirement and really having a major change in his lifestyle is it's hard to think about, um, and what life retire, what life after retirement might be like for him, um, is is a little is a little scary. Uh, medical benefits, we we've come to find out that Medicare after we turn 65 may not cover the majority of 
medical expenses that an older population is incurring, and people really need to start thinking about carrying supplemental medical benefits even as, as they age. Um, and in Maine, the percent of the population over age 65 is growing at a faster pace here in Maine than in the rest of the country. I'm not sure we realize that. And in central Maine, um, that's where the oldest population tends to reside here. So we, as the employer community, um, are facing uh, older workers working longer, staying in the workforce. Um, and so what does that mean from a wellness standpoint, a uh, productivity standpoint? Um, as we age, we typically see higher incidence of chronic diseases, such as high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, arthritis, depression, and so forth. Um, and as you can see, when you look at this graph here, when you look in the above 45 age group, you know, in that 45 to 64 age, 67% or two-thirds of us have at least one chronic condition. And 40% of us have two or more chronic conditions. And you can see once we hit 65 years of age, almost nine out of 10 of us will have at least one chronic condition and two thirds will have two or more. Now that's pretty substantial. Um, and so these are our employees and our workers that are still um, in our workplaces and, and we typically will get sicker as we age and that's just what happens when we're not paying attention to our, our personal health. Um, so if you think about the average age of your own workforce, and if that is creeping up over 40, it's really something that employers need to start paying attention to. Um, here at Maine General, the average age of our workforce is about in the mid-40s as well. So it's something that we're focused on. In this slide, you can start to relate the number of chronic conditions to age and lost time and lost productivity. So if you look at the relationship of chronic conditions to lost time, uh, according to the National Health Interview Survey, more conditions, the more conditions a person has, the more work days are lost per year on average. And as you can see here, in, again, as we hit 40, um, healthy people lose only 2.3 days per year on average. But people who have one chronic condition, that increases to almost five lost days per year. And with more than one chronic condition, over 10 days per year are lost. So as an employer, and we're thinking of our productivity and uh, health of our employees, this is substantial as we have an, an aging workforce, or we're looking at that. As we look at the full cost of poor employee health, the direct medical care and pharmacy care costs, those medical costs, are really only the tip of the iceberg and represent only 25% of the total cost. If you look at everything below the surface, the, um, the intangible, sometimes intangible or um, less indirect costs are really around absence, which is people are not at work, so they're not productive. It contributes to our short-term and long-term disability costs and so forth. Um, but the other thing to consider, too, is that we have this thing called presenteeism, which means that employees are at work. So they're not absent, but they're at work, but they're not focused on their work. They're not as productive as they could be, and that could be because of stress or health-related issues and so on and so forth. And that 75% of the productivity cost is something that we should be paying attention to. So we want to move into talking about applying an employee well-being um, to your business strategy. Uh, we work at Workplace Health, um, the Occupational Medicine Department of Maine General. We work with many human resources managers um, on their occupational health and their workers' comp strategies. And often they're being delegated the responsibility of developing a wellness program for their organization. And human resource people, we know, often wear many hats. They're responsible for hiring, performance management, discipline, benefit plan oversight, retention strategies, among many other things. And oftentimes, they're the folks that, that we find are understand the importance of investing in human capital, the importance of having a robust wellness program and engaged workforce. Um, but that's a lot to take on. Um, a, developing a wellness program is not an easy task. 
uh, especially for a, a smaller employer with maybe one human resources representative. Today, we encourage our business partners to make employee well-being part of the overall business strategy. And so not to think about it as a program that resides in human resources uh, or as part of the benefit package, but really employee health and well-being really should be part of the overall business strategy. And when this is done successfully, there are many advantages that the organization then benefits from. Um, and I'm going to let Chuck talk about how that has benefited us at Maine General. Oh, I've got one more, sorry. So employee well-being. If you take care of your employees, they'll take care of your business. This has really been our mantra. And you've got to make it part of your business strategy. And when you talk about wellness programs, a lot of times we're focused on if we improve the health of our population, how will that reduce our health care spending, our claim spending? And that's an important part of the big picture. But I think there's other parts that we need to consider. Um, one is around engagement, um, and there's a lot of talk about employee engagement, how critical that is. And engagement really means, you know, do they like their job? Are they engaged in their work? Are they doing good work for our organizations? Are they being productive? Um, and when you think about it, having a wellness program with a lot of fun activities that engage people in their personal health really helps to enhance the whole overall business engagement strategy of an organization. Um, the other piece that I think is really critical, too, is, is making health and employee well-being part of the culture. And the culture really comes from the leadership of the organization, the work environment of the organization, um, and many other factors. But it's really critical to make sure that we're, we're focused on all these areas. And now I'll let Chuck talk about the, uh, how we've been able to manage uh, and, and link those to our, our priorities here at Maine General. So, what you're seeing on the screen now, or at least some of the ways that your corporate priorities can be linked to um, your employees' health, and, and all these, as you'll see, are really critical to the, the business success. But just as important as you approach these corporate priorities is really setting goals and measuring the outcomes. So I'd like to share some of the learnings um, and some of the successes we've enjoyed at Maine General over the years. As a healthcare organization, um, you would think this was easy, but it hasn't always been easy. Um, it's really been an evolution over many years, trying things, some that worked, some that didn't, refining them, you know, realigning the goals and the strategies to adjust to really both the changing needs and our changing environment. So health systems like Maine General have been through many of these challenges over the past decade. I mean, we've merged, consolidated, grown, and in our case, a year and a half ago, we moved into a new hospital, which was an opportunity that we took advantage of to really um, change a lot of our infrastructure to support the culture of wellness. If you look at the, the evolution of the wellness efforts here at Maine General, I'll take you through this. And, and like Chuck said, this has been a lot of trial and error, but we've, we've learned and have done some really nice things that are, are worth talking about. We started our wellness program back in uh, 2002, and at that point, it resided in our human resources department. Uh, they hired a nurse uh, who was doing health risk appraisals with employees and we rewarded employees with a gift card for coming in and actually getting that done. Um, we also went smoke-free at that point. And then in 2004, uh, we started to offer reimbursements for local gyms. We wanted people to get physically active, and we paid for access to and, and worked in partnership with many gyms in our, our region. Uh, we continued to promote the uh, health risk assessments, and we started branding our program. Um, and at that time, it was called Life Engaged. Um, in 2006, we moved the wellness services out of the human resources department, and we moved it into the workplace health, the occupational medicine department here at Maine General. And that, in itself, I think, boosted uh, participation. Uh, I think it's natural tendency is that employees don't want their employers to know about their personal lifestyles and health risk and certainly not their human resources department. So, um, and, and privacy is always something that employees um, are concerned about. 
And so when it was moved out of the human resources department, and, and I still look at human resources as, as my, my customer, and I work in partnership with our human resources and our benefits folks to really make sure that we're moving our program in the right direction. But we saw a nice boost in our employee participation rate in our wellness program when it was moved out of the department. We also started using um, a different software system, the Wellness Works Tracking System, which really allowed us to start to demonstrate um, and quantify our outcomes and the cost benefit of what we were doing. We moved from just doing health, uh, health risk assessments to actually hiring health coaches and doing more coaching and working one-on-one -on -one with our employees on their personal health plans. Um, in 2008, after using the new software for a couple of years, we were able to demonstrate um, outcomes um, and the financial impact of what we thought we were no longer spending because we were seeing our employees get healthier. We also instituted an e-newsletter that goes to all employees on a monthly basis and did a lot more in terms of education, communication, and programming and, and challenges that, that really got to get, to get people more engaged. Um, we rebranded our wellness program to um, become a healthier you. In 2013, more recently, we started to focus more on culture. Um, we had just moved into our new hospital, um, which is on a gorgeous uh, plot of land with walking paths, a new environment, um, healthy cafeteria, and so forth. So we capitalized on really a focus on the culture here at the organization. We also uh, instituted the Healthy Living Resource Center, which is a community-based um, program. We organize stakeholders within our organization, which are really anyone in this organization who had a role with improving the health of our employees, um, and brought them together in terms of building better strategy and focus, and that has been really, really effective. Um, we also identified and trained champions in every physical location and department within Maine General, and we have um, well over 100 champions that are basically promoting uh, wellness programs and well-being and educating people in their own work areas. Most recently, in 2015, March of this year, we partnered with Virgin Pulse, and so we finally um, are enhancing the program with technology. So uh, Virgin Pulse has a web-based application um, as well as a phone app. So those of us who um, like to track things, um, it has a social media component so we can form teams, we can challenge each other, and it, what we're finding is it really has further boosted our engagement of the wellness program at Maine General. Here's a slide of what happens. Um, our claims cost per employee per year. And you can see back in early in 2006, 2007, that's where we were identifying that we were spending more in our health care claims uh, than was expected. And that's when we knew we had a problem. We needed to do something to address it. Um, and so that's where we really made the focus on the wellness program, including personalized health coaching for our employees. We hired more people. We increased participation. And then you can see in 2008, and then since then, we really have flattened the curve of our health plan spending. Maine General is self-funded for its health insurance and our health plan. And this, is, this was remarkable. So for many years, you can see that our health care spending was way below the expected trends. And during those four to five years or so, um, we didn't increase our premium cost to our employees because we were holding our costs down. Our wellness software that we use help us to quantify what we think uh, contributed to that. And so in this graph, if you look at, this represents uh, a, about 1,500 people, and this is back a few years ago, but the blue bars are what their health risk score was when they started um, in their wellness program and on their health risk assessment. And then over several years, looking at that same cohort of people, you can see that their health risk scores improved over time. So you can see the low risk red bar going substantially up, um, while our high risk number of folks were going down. 
At the same time, in 2008 through the present, we actually look at and work with our TPA on what are our low-risk people costing us from a health plan standpoint, what are our medium risk, what are our high-risk people costing, um, and started to look at those numbers. And, and clearly, we could see that our low-risk people were costing us much less than our medium or high-risk folks. And the same held true year after year. We also started looking at the employees who chose not to be in our wellness program, but who were on our health plan and what they may be costing, what the spouse population is costing, and, and we, don't, we didn't have a lot of engagement at all with spouses, so that was a real big challenge. But when you start looking at the differences between what a low-risk person costs, so back in 2008, a low-risk person was costing us on average about $4,000 and our high-risk costs were almost $10,000. So it was pretty substantial. Um, we can continue to look at that and, and, and started to look at our, our non-participating employees who are costing us on average over $5,000. They're about the same as our, a medium-risk bucket. Mm -hmm. And our spouse population were costing us as much as our high-risk people. So this was good information for us to look at and track. And the way we tried to quantify things and and this is based on 2012 average claim cost. But if you looked at the difference between a low-risk person and a medium-risk person, and you look at the, the change, we had several hundred people that changed their risk scores from medium to low or from high to medium. And if you look at those numbers and you look at the variance between what a low-risk person was costing us and a medium and a high-risk person, the difference between a high risk and a medium person was $5,000. So simply by doing the math and saying, if we have 143 people that lower their risk score from high to medium, and that variance is about $5,000 per person, we think that we didn't spend you know, $730,000 of health care spending. And if you add that all together, it's close to a million dollars. So that gets the attention of the CEO and the CFO of any organization. Um, and that really just allowed us to reinvest what we think we're not spending in terms of holding our health care costs down. Um, so this is it's a real good success story, and we continue to work hard on this. So let's talk a little bit about the impact. Um, we had uh, three years with no benefit cost increases um, to our employees. We saved um, millions of dollars for the organization, which really helped our bottom line. We had a, uh, really a more engaged workforce, and we um, actually measure that with a survey against other healthcare systems. And we're, for two years, we're in the top 20 in the nation. Um, they won't tell you if you're one or 20, but we know we're in the top 20 in the nation for employee engagement. And then our workers' compensation rates were low. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, you can see the trending graph for our workers' comp. And you'll see the last um, year, 7-1-2015, that's an actuarial estimation of where we're going to end up. Um, that's our year. And so we will end up with a couple months to go here in the year. Um, and you can really see the, the, the big spike in uh, main general community care. For us, that's our home health care nurses. And um, we all experienced the winter this year. And um, they're out on the roads constantly and walking to houses. So we've had a little bit of a challenge there. But you can still see, even with that, our overall mod rate of 0.47. Um, excellent. So let's talk a little bit about um, our key steps to a successful wellness program. Um, we're fortunate to, you know, to have a team that really um, stays in tune with the, the latest and greatest on wellness, uh, a lot of seminars, a lot of um, interacting with other folks to, to get new ideas and breathe new light. But I think one of the, the biggest um, issues is really uh, involving leadership, and we all need to be visible on um, these programs. I think it, it really moves um, the, the rest of the organization. Um, communication is a, is a big piece. We put, um, I do a weekly 
report um, via email to everyone in the organization and we include a help tip. We uh, evaluate our health on a, at the senior management team level. At, at we get our leadership group together, we review it. Um, you know, we make it part of our culture. Um, it's not okay to smoke. We encourage healthy eating. Um, and so, and, and we're committed resources to it. Um, here you're looking at um, a program that we started uh, a couple of years ago where we actually split the organization into two teams. And we had um, various activities for those teams. Everybody was on a team, and we challenged each other with steps, uh, healthy eating. Um, it was a variety of different uh, events we had that went on for quite a while. And at the end, we tallied up all the scores. And the winner of the, of the uh, program, which unfortunately was not my team, um, we donated to their charity of choice. So it's just ideas like that that I think um, are critical. And Denise showed you some of the savings, at least in one particular year. Um, we invest um, about a half a million dollars a year in the wellness of our our staff. And it's certainly, you know, you see the financial implications on the health cost side, but it's even bigger than that as Denise talked about with presenteeism um, and engagement of the workforce. So, you know, a lot of it's about behavioral economics and when um, given a choice, a third of us will use the information and, and make the right decision, but the other two thirds will either <clears throat> follow their leaders or take the easy way out and do the simplest thing. So, um, the second item of success is to, to make things easy for your employees. Um, here's a picture of our cafeteria. When you walk in, uh, the first thing you see is the salad bar. Um, you know, we've re removed all of the, um, all the uh, deep fry, fry layers or whatever they're called um, from the cafeteria. We've switched to um, healthy vending machines. Um, and it's a, it's a for process over time. I think one of the most impactful things we did was move to um, health coaching. And for us, you know, there's um, nothing like being accountable to having to meet with a health coach after setting goals and, and coming back and, and telling them whether you met the goals or not. And it's really hard to be accountable to a computer, which makes the face-to-face -face meetings all that more important. You're talking from personal experience. Personal experience, <laughs> yeah. So, and, the, and we, I did talk about the culture, and really that drives a lot of it, um, because we certainly need to, you know, practice what we, what we preach. Um, but we've got to create a, a culture where people want to be healthy and, and use the available resources. Um, so it's really something that we focus in uh, every, everything we do. The, um, what you see here is some of the things we've done around cultures and culture. And as uh, Denise had talked when we, um, in the last two buildings that we did, we created walking paths in the Alpine Center for Health. We have a teaching kitchen to teach how to um, cook healthy. Um, and all of this, although, you know, we were fortunate to, to be able to redesign our facility, um, you know, a lot of small businesses, they have teams that walk during lunch um, and really encourage each other to get some physical exercise or eat healthy. I've known some that have even had uh, small gardens on their site um, to, to really improve the healthy eating. There are, there are many um, community resources out there. These are only a couple, but it's really uh, working with your staff so that they know what those resources are and they can get the support that they need. 
And then, as I talked about, focus on employee engagement and really, um, you know, recognizing staff for their commitment um, and focusing on those and and really um, getting the good stories out through the organization. Um, and it trickles down both to their families um, and their friends. So it's it's really important to engage. And then one of the one of the things that I think we are very proud about is um, our reward system um, for employees who are engaged in our wellness program. And in general, we've used nothing but carrots um, to get people to voluntarily participate in our wellness programs. Um, we've never had the, we've not gotten to the point that we tie uh, wellness participation or outcomes to our benefit plan expense. We don't penalize people who are smokers or anything like that. And and I say this because I think it's important that we've had a, a lot of tremendous success with our program, and it's, it's always been a voluntary, highly encouraged, and somewhat rewarded with, you know, gift cards and uh, other um, benefits. But um, it, it doesn't take a whole lot. And I think when you get to the point that, you're building a culture around health, which is, I think, where we have come, is that being healthy is the right thing to do, and it's less about the reward, it's less about the financial gift card that they get in the end of the day, but it's really about how can I, you know, work with my coworkers on a daily basis and take care of each other, take care of our health, have fun doing it, um, and, and think about, you know, what does it take to really be healthy, because being healthy contributes to the success of the whole organization. And we've done a lot of work to communicate that back to our employees, is that, you know, we haven't had rises in our health care spending. Despite having more employees here at Maine General over the years, our health plan costs have stayed flat. And that is a benefit to all of us. That allows us to uh, perform better as an organization. It allows us to give financial wage increases to our employees. It allows us to keep our health plan costs down to our employees. And that's really the good business strategy that comes out of it. So just to wrap up here, it's really what does an employee health management look like? And for us, it's really centered around the employee and their family. Um, and then we support those employees with benefits and wellness programs, the work environment, the policies that we have in place to promote health the organizational culture, and then surrounding and using the community resources that may be available. And so if I just show you for a second what that might look like, here's, here's Heather. Heather is a registered nurse at Maine General. She's been an employee here for more than 15 years. And if you're an employee at Maine General, um, she and her family are all on our benefit plan, and, ha and she has the uh, ability to be involved with our wellness program and all the offerings that we have. So she has access to robust benefits, which cover prevention 100%, the wellness rewards programs that we have in place. She has access to personal health coaching with a health coach, smoking cessation support if she needs it, and uh, wellness challenges, uh, especially now through our Virgin Pulse Partnership, and our EAP program. Her work environment is that of some, one that promotes health. Heather works at the new hospital here, the Alphonse Center for Health. And here we have walking trails on campus. Uh, employee parking is quite a walk away, so you actually get your steps in when you come into work every day. We have healthy cafeteria options and healthy vending options within the building for her. It's a tobacco-free campus. We don't allow smoking, and that includes third-hand smoke. Um, we have a spiritual center that she can go to and, and meditate and relax and get away from the floor if she needs to. And we have used the stair campaigns throughout the, the building um, that advocates to use the stairs rather than the elevators. The healthy culture here that she's also supported by is really around senior leadership support. Our senior management team are engaged. Um, they are supportive not only financially, but they're visibly active in our wellness programs. They talk about it at the senior level. They talk about it with our management team. Health is part of our strategic plan. Um, we're a health organization, so that's one thing, but employee health is really part of our strategic plan. 
and health is part of the organizational vision and mission. We have a wellness department of champions and, 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 the man, and her manager actually supports wellness in the department as well. Um, and this has not come with ease. It's hard. We've always had top level support. We have employees who are engaged in, in participating in the wellness program and sometimes the most difficult part is that middle management who are very busy and have a lot on their plate um, and we're continuously asking them to think about the health of their staff and their workforce. And this is all surrounded by the community resources that we have here at Maine General. We have a prevention center that offers a lot of services, the Healthy Living Resource Center, um, gym memberships, and so much more. Here in the greater Kennebec Valley, um, the Workplace Health Department has done a lot of work with different companies in our region to help and support them and develop their wellness programs. And I can say that with the foundation of uh, strong leadership support, but also putting a health coach in the workplace to work with employees to help create personal wellness plans and keep them engaged and hold them accountable, every one of these companies has experienced some benefit from having a wellness program in place. Um, and it changes from company to company, um, and the challenges are different in every company, but they're all doing something that's really been worthwhile. So we want to encourage others to, to do that as well. And that wraps it up for us. Uh, just final thoughts are, you know, we're all aging, um, and unfortunately, as we age, the incidence of chronic disease um, is there. And, uh, but we don't need to be unhealthy as we age. And so if we eat well, we take care of ourselves, we sleep well, um, and employers in our area can really do a lot to support the, the well-being of their workforces. So with that, I can turn it over to Marie for any questions. Thank you very much, Chuck and Denise. That was great. Very much appreciated. Uh, we do have a few questions. Um, the first one is, how can I get my senior leadership on board to not only support but demonstrate the leadership needed for a successful employee health and productivity management wellness program? Yeah, and I think um, from our perspective, you know, we, we started small and um, saw some results which made us want to invest even more um, in wellness. So I think. It's obviously hard when you've got a senior management team that has a lot of priorities, and this this one, I don't think people understand the magnitude of the benefit that it can provide. But certainly, I I think by um, starting small and, and showing results, I mean nobody, you know, throws a hail mary pass on the first down of a football game. Um, so it's it's small steps that show improvement, and I think that's probably the the best way to, to keep the ball rolling. One of the things that I think a, a couple of years ago, as I look at our senior leadership team, we've, we've always made approximately a half a million dollar investment in our wellness program, which is, is not a small chunk of change. Um, but a few years ago, we went, we had the, the gall to go to Chuck and the senior leadership team and, and say, we really need you to walk the talk even more. And it wasn't just about the investment in wellness, but to really experience that so that we could get the trickle down effect through the, the middle management team. And so the wellness manager here actually uh, created a challenge for the senior leadership team and put pedometers on their hips and had them report their steps on a weekly basis. And the senior leadership uh, challenged the uh, administrative director level, which is the level right before them. Uh, and and it, was a, it wasn't a highly publicized thing, but it was something that got every senior and every administrative director to really understand that if you're only getting 3,000 steps in, you're pretty sedentary. And how difficult it was to have 7,000, 10,000 steps, especially when you're in a leadership position, you're in meetings all day, you're largely sedentary, um, and when you're as tall as Chuck is and you have long legs, you know, he had his excuse for not getting his steps in. Um, but I, I think one of the best ways is to get the senior leadership, and even if it's just a few of the seniors, to actually put a pedometer on and to do something like that, then um, they're going to actually feel what it's like and how challenging it may be for folks to eat healthy, to get their water intake, to 
sleep eight hours a day. And that's essentially what we had them do. And then it's almost the light bulb goes off a little bit and they say, you know what, this is really hard stuff, but it's important stuff to have um, the organization really pay attention to. And so when we did that and they actually went through that experience, we started to see a lot more activity in terms of engagement at all levels of our organization. That's great. Um, we actually are getting several questions, so um, it, hopefully we, you can just try to keep them a little, the answers a little more concise so I can squeeze them all in for you. But um, the first one is, what vendor do you use for your cafeteria and vending services? They are all employees of Maine General. Um, we do not vendor it out. Um, it's our own uh, food and nutrition department here, um, and they manage it. Okay, great. Um, what are you doing to ensure employee staffing is adequate to enable people to take breaks, minimize overtime, so they can consistently practice what you're preaching? You know, part of the culture here has always been that when employees go to meet with their health coach, they do it on company time. They don't have to clock out to do that. Um, and we've just built the culture um, that encourages uh, physical activity, uh, stress breaks, you know, whatever is necessary because ultimately if our employees are feeling well and their heads are clear and they're alert, they're going to provide better patient care to our patients and our community. And uh, so we don't spend a lot of time tracking or managing that. We just, it's part of the culture and it's part of how we do business. Okay. Um, do you think these strategies translate to small employers who are not self-insured? Absolutely. Um, with the slide that I had with some of the companies up there, we have employers um, with fewer than 50 employees who have a comprehensive wellness program in place. Um, they have a health coach that goes to their workplace. Uh, the smaller the employer, you know, the less frequency the health coach goes to the workplace. But that, the small employer I'm thinking of will tell you, you know, they were dabbling in wellness. They were trying to do some fun things. They knew it was important. But it wasn't until they actually um, contracted out with the consultant that really paved the way on this is how you do it, this is how you do it well, brought a health coach in, um, and, and really got engagement where it needs to be. So I think absolutely, uh, the bigger the employer, the more employees that are participating, uh, the more health coaching hours that a company is going to need um, to really get the behavior change piece uh, in place. Okay, I think we have time for <clears throat> maybe just one or two more questions. Um, is there a number one prevailing influence that you find changes people's behavior, such as the culture of wellness, financial incentives, or sharing actual data with the employees? Was data the main impetus for Maine General to make changes? Um, you know, our rising health care costs really got the organization to do something and pay attention, and that came from our human resources department way back when. At the employee level, I think, and the way we advise companies when they're just starting a wellness program, is that you offer an incentive to get them to the table, to get them to participate and to experience whatever it is that you're going to offer. Um, and I think sometimes money talks, and sometimes to get things going, that financial incentive uh, is important to get people to the table. But over time, it's less about that financial incentive, and it's really, we're focused on engagement and making it fun. And, um, you know, we're launching a challenge right now where the whole organization is creating teams and challenging each other on who, which team could get the most steps within the course of a period of time. And uh, we're really trying to make it a fun um, activity that just helps all the way around. And so I think at this point we've gotten to the point that it's less about the financial piece of the financial incentive. Okay, thank you, Denise. I, um, I'm going to just give you one final question here. Um, do you think, uh, do you advise people to hire a consultant to help them with their wellness program development? So I could be very biased in answering that and say absolutely. Um, I do think that uh, most businesses are not in the healthcare business. Uh, most businesses, and, and even years ago when uh, the senior leaders moved the wellness program from the human resources department to my department at Workplace Health, um, I, we didn't know how to do wellness, and, and wellness means a hundred different things to a hundred different people. 
Um, and it's really hard to sort through all of the information out there and try to establish what's right for your organization. So keeping that in mind, I think hiring a consultant that knows best practice, that's following the research and the data that's saying this is what's working, I think has a lot of benefit. I also think that having a health coach coming in to work in a face-to-face -face manner with employees in a personalized approach helps people to make those really difficult changes in lifestyle and behaviors and attain their goals, but it also helps hold them accountable because I know when I have to meet with my health coach in three months and I set a personal goal for myself, and if I haven't been working on that, you know, that's not a good thing that I want to present to my health coach. So I think that accountability also helps with uh, personal and overall success of the organization. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I very much appreciate it, and uh, I hope everybody else has enjoyed it as well. Um, so thank you very much, Denise and Chuck, and that will conclude our webinar for today.